All good stories should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Unless that end involves John Marston dying, in which case they should stop at the middle and then just sort of ride around a horse in it, having a good time. There are some game endings, though, that not only draw the story to a conclusion, but are also so twisty, so mind-blowing, so unexpected, that they changed everything we thought we knew about the game up until that point. Obviously, seeing as we're going to be talking about the actual endings of games, there are some pretty major spoilers ahead, so do proceed at your own peril, but enjoy! about the old location, you know. Uh, some people still have a somewhat negative impression of the company. Uh, that old restaurant was kind of left to rot for quite a while, but uh, I want to reassure you, Badbury Entertainment is committed to family fun and above all, safety. With the wealth of quick-service pizza restaurants available to hungry consumers these days, you really need a unique selling point to help you stand out in the crowded market. Maybe you could design your own topping combinations, that's fun! Or your restaurant could be crammed with murderous animatronic animals who will kill you and stuff your mangled corpse into a mascot costume! Maybe not that. Sadly, it's the second option that Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria from Five Nights at Freddy's went with, as seen in the first game in the series, in which you play as a night security guard desperately trying not to be murdered by a host of terrifying robot personas. Throughout the game, you get voicemail messages from your predecessor which fill you in on the restaurant's backstory and hint at a bloody past. Uh, they used to be allowed to walk around during the day, too, but then there was the bite of 87. Yeah. It's amazing that the human body can live without the frontal lobe, you know? And it's clear the place has seen better days. It's filthy, the electronics are busted, and the animatronics would be gross and terrifying even if they weren't killing people. Which they are. That's why it's a relief when you start Five Nights at Freddy's 2 to discover that Freddy Fazbear's has been given a much-needed makeover and is having a grand reopening. Uh, hello? Hello, hello? Uh, hello and welcome to your new summer job at the new and improved Freddy Fazbear's Pizza. The place looks a lot cleaner, the animatronics are in much better condition, and they've even been upgraded with new technology, so that's probably fine and nothing to worry about. They've spent a small fortune on these new animatronics. Uh, facial recognition, advanced mobility... Except that it definitely is something to worry about, and the exact same thing happens again, with you having to keep a watchful eye on the animatronics to make sure they don't bust into the room and jump scare you to death. <sighs> Persevere, however, and you'll make it to the end of the titular fifth night at Freddy's, at which point you'll be awarded your paycheck. Man, we really earned that. One hundred dollars! The big news here, though, is that the check is dated 1987, and the reason that everything looks clean and new is that Five Nights at Freddy's 2 is actually a prequel to the original game. It also means the events you've played through up to this point are all part of the bloody past that you were warned about in the first game, which is little comfort as you head into the game's sixth night and get your face bitten off. I know it's 1987, but still, $100 seems like not very much to have my frontal lobe bitten in half, Freddy. Make it 200 then we'll talk. 150 last offer. At first glance, 2008 indie platformer Braid looks like if the Super Mario Bros were freshman philosophy students, this being a game in which you alternate between reading thoughtful books about the nature of forgiveness and jumping on bad guys. Ah yes, drawing on the deontological ethics of Immanuel Kant, of course. The game's main hook, however, came in main character Tim's ability to manipulate time. Starting on stage 2 with the ability to rewind time, more and more time powers are added throughout the game as Tim carries out his quest to save a princess who has been snatched by what the game describes as a horrible and evil monster. As the game goes on, Tim unlocks more powers and we learn about the relationship between Tim and the princess, a relationship that is slowly revealed to have been jealous, possessive, and overshadowed by an unspecified mistake that Tim had made. Tim, my dude, mistakes are what the rewind time button is for. What, you think I meant to get eaten by that plant? 
It is the final level, however, that turns everything on its head. For anyone who has played a Mario game, it starts out pretty familiar and straightforward. The princess escapes from the clutches of a brutish foe, she flees, and you follow underneath as she disables traps for you, trying to meet up with her so that you can ensure her safety. When you do finally catch up to her, though, everything changes. This is when you realise that, in fact, everything in the level except for you has been running in reverse. The princess is actually running away from you. She's setting the traps to try and slow you down, and the knight at the beginning, who you thought had kidnapped her, he was waiting for her, ready to help her escape the horrible and evil monster, otherwise known as you. Stick that in your deontological ethics and smoke it. There are other interpretations of Braid's story, and its creator Jonathan Blow has even said that he couldn't explain the real story adequately in human words, but then that's the sort of thing he says all the time. You know, making it was about, let me take my deepest flaws and vulnerabilities and put them in the game. The point is that as rug pull endings go, this is an entire fitted carpet, and it completely reframes everything we'd done in the game up to this point to discover that the princess was just trying to get away from us the whole time. Mario never had to deal with any of this, we assume. In Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain, you play as Venom Snake, aka Big Boss, the head of the Diamond Dogs private military corporation, who you'd have to think would be a lot more successful if they didn't spend all their time kidnapping people with balloons, maintaining a private zoo, and developing inflatable versions of their boss. The game's story is filled with the usual twists and turns you expect from a Kojima game, but the real bombshell comes right at the end. That's a metaphorical bombshell, there are plenty of real ones before that. Backtracking a little bit, Metal Gear Solid V The Phantom Pain was preceded by a prologue called Ground Zeroes, in which Snake has to infiltrate a black site called Camp Omega, and also Hideo Kojima is there. What took you so long? Things go pretty well, all things considered, right up until the end, at which point they go about as bad as it's possible to go, in that the helicopter Snake is attempting to leave in blows up. That's why you start Metal Gear Solid V in a hospital bed, and why you've lost an arm, but gained a big chunk of shrapnel sticking out of your forehead, both of which came as something of a surprise during the game's first mission, in which you escape the hospital with a mysterious bandaged stranger called Ishmael. Who are you? Who am I? You're talking to yourself. Been watching over you for nine years. You can call me Ishmael. Get to the end of the game, though, and you realise that this whole time you haven't been playing as Big Boss at all. What about him? He uh, took some shrapnel to the head. Rather, you've been playing as one of his loyal medics who was injured in the same helicopter crash as the boss, who was then given plastic surgery and hypnotherapy while in a coma to allow the real big boss, who was disguised as Ishmael, to undertake some top secret missions. Now this one, he'll take your place. From here on, He's Snake. Did you get all that? TLDR, you spend the whole game playing as a snake impersonator rather than Snake himself, which is a pretty major mind f to lay on the player considering how much time we'd spent as the character up to that point. Man, it's not the same when I know it's supposed to be someone else. Gentlemen, welcome to Dubai. Yep, it's still dead. Yet to be seen, Sergeant. You got a lock on that transmission? Yes, sir. About 800 yards away. And we're 800 yards away from seeing who's more full of shit. You are intel. At first glance, Spec Ops The Line appears to be the most generic military shooter imaginable, with its cover-based shooting, gung-ho action, and shaven-headed cheekbony protagonist, Captain Martin Walker. He's even voiced by Nolan North, for goodness sake. Dubai's running out of time, gentlemen. Let's move. 
I can already hear the Mountain Dew DLC downloading in the background. Walker has been sent to a sandstormed ravaged Dubai to rescue one Colonel John Conrad, because this is a Heart of Darkness story and it's important that you recognise the important themes, capital I, capital T, going on around you. As Walker and his squad struggle through the sand-swept palaces and shopping malls, he's forced to make tough decisions and brutal sacrifices as he uncovers the extent of the carnage and devastation that Conrad and his unit have left in their wake. There is a line men like us have to cross. It's a bad time, basically, but throughout you're trying to retain your humanity in the face of overwhelming odds and the one bit where the game forces you to use white phosphorus on a bunch of civilians. Thanks, game. Finally, at the end of this heartbreaking slog, you make it to the tower where Conrad has holed up, only to make the shocking discovery that Conrad is con-dead, and has been for ages. What's more, the reprehensible acts ascribed to Conrad and his troops throughout the game by Walker are, in fact, Walker's own doing. You did this. No, you did. Your orders killed 47 innocent people. This surprise twist recontextualizes the entire story as you realize that a lot of the things you saw weren't real. What the hell happened? I don't know, he just stopped moving. Walker, snap out of it. And also that your team were gradually becoming aware that you were losing your grip on reality. He wouldn't listen. We didn't have a choice. He turned us into f killers. What you do with this new information is up to you, as the game has multiple possible endings, which range from shooting yourself in the head, surrendering to a passing patrol, or murdering everybody and wandering off into the desert. We heard shots. Is everything okay? Sergeant Roberts, what is going on? Gentlemen, welcome to Dubai. Starting to see why there was no Mountain Dew DLC, to be honest. Oh. Huh? Ah. Get down here, Merc. Final Fantasy VII is one of the most beloved games of all time, so when it was announced that Square Enix was working on a gorgeous big-budget remake, fans were beside themselves about being able to re-experience such iconic moments as Don Corneo's mansion, the fight against Sephiroth, and of course, the time you get into a squat contest with some rando. And when the first part of the Final Fantasy remake released this year, that's what fans mostly got. Obviously the squat contest made it in, that's a given. Yeah. Who'd have thought it'd be this close? As you play though, you start to notice that not everything is quite as you remember. It's not until the end of the game, however, that it becomes clear that the Final Fantasy VII Remake isn't a remake at all, but rather a total reimagining of the story that changes everything you thought you knew about Final Fantasy VII. The biggest new mystery in the remake was the identity and purpose of the Whispers, wraith-like ghostly figures that look like baby Dementors and spend a lot of time hassling people in a very specific yet totally mysterious way. Perhaps best described as Arbiters of Fate. We learn from a talking dog, because this is a Final Fantasy game, that fate exists, is a fixed state, and is the will of the very planet itself. The Whispers are drawn to people who attempt to alter the course of fate and make sure that they don't by dementoring them up. What? Oh, what is this fascinating phenomenon? It becomes increasingly clear during the remake's final hours that the fate that the planet wants is the events of the original Final Fantasy VII, and any attempt by characters to have anything new or unexpected happen is thwarted, such as when Sephiroth kills Barrett, something that absolutely didn't happen in the original game, and thanks to the whispers, doesn't happen in this one either. This death was not the one ordained for you by fate. At the very end of the remake, Sephiroth cuts through the cloud of whispers that's keeping the timeline on the right track, and is now outside the bounds of the fate that the planet has in store for them all. Aerith creates a similar path for your party, and declares that this is the point of no return, the point where they turn off the path of the original game and onto something different. So from here on out it's not a remake, it's a new game entirely, one concerned with alternate realities, different timelines, and is it just me, or is it getting a bit Kingdom Hearts up in here? I guess… maybe… That's why I hesitated. And yes, I know this seems like an extremely elaborate way of engineering it so that Aerith doesn't have to die, but is anyone complaining? I mean, apart from the entire Final Fantasy community on Reddit? It's okay. 
We'll find a way out together. Everything that lives is designed to end. They are perpetually trapped in a never-ending spiral of life and death. However, life is all about the struggle within this cycle. If you want to talk about endings that recontextualize everything that came before them, and boy do we, then we need to talk about existential action RPG near Automata. In this game, you start out playing the lingerie enthusiast combat android named 2B, who is fighting an army of machines on behalf of humankind, which is nowhere to be seen, alongside your earnest android sidekick 9S, who is everywhere to be seen. Better keep your guard up. I'm aware of how to fight. After many hours, there comes a seemingly climactic boss fight, after which 9S becomes infected with a so-called logic virus, and 2B is forced to mercy strangle him. <laughs> <laughs> Following the mercy strangling, 9S is dead and it is sad. <laughs> Except then he's not dead, because his consciousness has survived and it is not sad, cue the end credits. Wait a second, 2B! The trick here is that the ending of Near Automata isn't actually the ending of Near Automata. If you think you've enjoyed and understood the full story just because you've seen the credits roll once, then my friend, you are wronger than that robot opera singer. Those look like corpses. Anyway, you can complete your first playthrough of the game and receive what appears to be a resolution, but you've barely scratched the surface until you play through the game again and again. This battle will likely have a great effect on the outcome of the war. 2B and I, our battle will continue for some time to come. But that's another story for another day. In this way, you will battle through variations of the campaign that let you see things through the for some reason blindfolded eyes of 9S, and then experience events as a third android character by the name of A2. Huh? What's that? Proposal. Use Podfire to force him to stop. With perseverance or sheer bloody mindedness on your third time around, you will eventually unlock what is considered the true ending of the game. And you better hold on to something solid because it's going to rock your world. In this true ending of the game, 9S and A2 lay down some earth-shattering revelations in an extended bout of real talk before a climactic final duel. This tower is a giant cannon that's aimed at the human server on the moon. In the final minutes of this game, 9S spills the tea. He confirms your suspicions that the human race for which the androids are supposedly fighting is already long dead and gone. Humanity is extinct. This means, among other things, that both sides of this conflict have been deceived into fighting an utterly pointless war for thousands of years. The Commander? Me? To be? Sacrificial lambs. All of us. Isn't that hilarious? Doesn't it make you laugh? But the real Shyamalan-style reveal is that protagonist 2B was actually an executioner android secretly tasked with murdering 9S every time he got close to the terrible truth. It always ends like this. And murder him she did, over and over. 2B hated to keep killing you. It caused her so much pain. <laughs> the 9S type is a high-end model. They knew you'd discover the truth eventually, but the model designation 2B was just a cover. The official designation is 2E, number 2 Type E. They were a special class of members designed to execute Yorha units. Not only that reveal, but we also find 9S was actually wise to this cycle of him always being murdered by his close companion 2B. But you knew that, right 9S? <laughs> Shut up! SHUT UP! All of which casts the preceding 40 hours of your experience in a strange new light, what with all the irritable small talk and eventual friendship taking place in a loop of inevitable murder against a backdrop of eternal war. Better keep your guard up. 
I'm aware of how to fight. If all that seems a bit grim and nihilist, it is. But there remains the slim hope that our android heroes will break the cycle and you can stop playing Near Automata. However, the possibility of a different future also exists. A future is not given to you. It is something you must take for yourself. I am your brother. No. No. That's not true. That's impossible. Search your feelings. You know it to be true. No! Twist endings are great because they can really surprise the audience and make them think, like when it turned out Luke Skywalker was a ghost all along, or the end of The Sixth Sense where it turned out that Bruce Willis was his father. I think I've got that right. For a real brain twister of an ending though, we turn to Monkey Island 2 La Truck's Revenge, because yes, I will talk about it at any given opportunity, it turns out there is no legal way to stop me. If I hear this story one more time, I'm gonna be crying myself! The main story of the game involves you, as Guybrush Threepwood, trying to stop the full resurrection of your nemesis, the ghost pirate Le Chuck. Having banished his spirit form at the end of the first game, you're now having to deal with his body, which has been resurrected through voodoo magic and is, for want of a better word, Drippy. No one gets the upper hand on the Chuck without getting what he deserves. Eventually, after many hours of using things on other things, you make it to the game's final area, the tunnels underneath Dinky Island, which is where the game takes a turn for the creepy and surreal. For a start, everything seems a bit modern for a game ostensibly set during the 1700s. There are oxygen cylinders, syringes, vending machines, elevators, and all sorts of other things that you wouldn't expect to exist before the harnessing of electricity. Also the skeletons of Guybrush's parents, which I mean, how do they get down here? And don't say voodoo, because that's your answer to everything, Monkey Island. Say, that wouldn't happen to be a voodoo doll, would it? Anyway, soon you defeat LeChuck down here using, what else, voodoo, only to discover that LeChuck is in fact wearing a mask. Underneath the mask lies the face of Chucky, Guybrush's older brother, who has never been seen or indeed mentioned prior to this moment, and also, what? My god, you're my creepy brother Chucky. Then a boiler suited employee turns up and boots you both out into a modern day amusement park where you're now kids being scolded by their parents for running off and pretending to be pirates. What is this place? Well, it's not the screaming weenie hut where we told you to meet us. That means that everything in Monkey Islands 1 and 2 was all the bored fantasy of a couple of runaway kids looking for adventure. I mean, it would certainly explain how I managed to steal so much stuff without ever once getting punched in the face, but even so. You boys didn't get in any trouble now, did you? At the start of the next game in the series, Curse of Monkey Island, this is all hand-wavingly explained away in the first two minutes as being some kind of, you guessed it, voodoo spell. When my quest for the fabulous treasure called Big Whoop has left me in this sorry state, I thought it would bring me fame and glory. Instead, it delivered me into the clutches of my enemy, the zombie pirate LeChuck. So everything is back to normal, but consider this. Monkey Island 2 was the last Monkey Island game that series creator Ron Gilbert worked on, and it's clear that he intended the amusement park plot twist to be the ending, and that he had plans to follow on from that point if he had continued at LucasArts. But that never happened, so now we're left wondering exactly what this ending means. How much of what came before and after is actually real? How much is fantasy, and how much is, I don't know, something to do with voodoo? At least 40%, you'd have to think. There you go, friends. Those were seven twist endings that changed everything we thought we knew about the stuff that preceded them and also blew our minds into the bargain. If you'd like another video to enjoy from Outside Xbox, might I recommend the Outside Xbox Friendship Challenge Test between me, Mike, Andy, adjudicated by Luke. It's just a little friendship wrecking ritual we like to do every so often. And um, maybe you'll get some insights into some of your favorite, hopefully, YouTube posts. Who knows? Or if you'd like something a little bit different to that, why not check out this video from Luke and Ellen over at Outside Extra. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again on Outside Xbox, hopefully.